I'm Laura Kelly and welcome to Polka Cape Cod TV. Today we're located at Littlefield Farm in Northeast Ham, my own backyard. And thanks to LCTV, Lower Cape Television, we're able to do a recording about honeybees. Thanks to honeybees, we have food. They are our link to vegetation on the planet. Um, they are the most aggressive pollinator on the planet. There are other pollinators, butterflies and bumblebees. Um, but I look at them as, as, you know, again, not as efficient. So a social butterfly, they go from plant to plant and they kind of flutter around and they get the job done eventually. But we can't rely on the butterfly and the bumblebee to fortify, you know, the population of humans and animals on this planet. The bumblebee, the way I see them, is they're kind of the, the fat on the couch, you know, the couch potato is sitting there with the remote control. And they'll get out and they'll, they will, you know, pollinate, they will forage, but they're definitely not like an efficient honeybee. A honeybee is born to work. As soon as they're born, this is really interesting, they come out of their little comb and they turn right around and their first job, their first duty is to clean up after their own baby birth. Talk about efficiency, huh? And so their next duty in about a week is uh, we're as a nurse bee, where they're then tending to the brood, the brood inside the hive. And then the next week of their life cycle, they get to come out and forage and pollinate and bring in um, food sources for those that are in the hive and beyond. Uh, the pollination process is really fascinating to me. Uh, the bee leaves the hive and goes to a flower where she's attracted to the flower. And that's just by chemistry. That just happens um, due to nature. And so then when she hangs out inside the flower and collects some pollen for her own hive for food, um, there's these itty bitty little pieces of pollen that attach to her. How come? How does that happen? That's actually through static cling because the bees wings when they fly are so fast that they have this the magneticness to them that just collects the pollen pieces like up to a hundred thousand little pieces attached to them it's amazing and so as soon as they leave they, they just bop to another flower to another flower to another flower and when they do that little pollen pieces go from the next to the next to the next and that's the pollination process it's really easy it's natural going on in nature all the time and and they don't even have to like they don't think about it they don't say okay i need this and i gotta bring it here it just already naturally sticks to them so i think it's absolutely the most fascinating thing going on is the chemistry between the plant the plant dies down to nothing it hibernates it comes up and it is all for food for the honeybees and um, so check it out sometime it's really interesting hi welcome to one of my hives we're gonna go inside and see what's going on that's the outer cover this is the inner cover And they're upstairs today, interesting. It's pretty hot, so they're spaced out. And then we're gonna see lots of frames. Oh, they're so nice and quiet and gentle. Oh, I just love my bees this year, they've been excellent. Wow, we have, we have capped honey. All right, so I want to come in and check it out while they're nice and quiet. You can actually <laughs> see that they look up now that there's lots of light that just came into their house because it's usually dark. They're, they're, their heads are all faced up. 
and they're just saying, what's going on? What's going on? Well, I'll tell you, I'm going to wreck your home a little bit just so I can take note of the situation. So let's see if we can find some honey and maybe even some babies today. All right, so I'm going to pull up a frame with my hand tool. This is like the bee tool. Only one you need being a beekeeper. Oh, it's nice and heavy. So here we go. This is a frame full of honey. As you can tell, it's dripping. Look at that. They built out, so unfortunately came off a little bit, but you can see it's some of it's called capped honey, where this honey is capped. She's got a really nice pattern going. And they get their little heads inside, isn't that great? Boy, they're so quiet today. And there's a larger one over here. He's a drone. There's a couple drones around, not too many. All of them are female, except the drones. And they're just drinking it up, aren't they? They're so cute. So this is excellent. It's great to see that the things are working. And on this side, you can see another perfect pattern going on. So this is a great looking situation. I'm gonna put this down and pull up one more for kicks over here and just see if we can see a difference. Maybe a different pattern. Who knows? But I always like to compare and contrast. Now this is drawn out, but there's no honey inside. It's really light. And they're actually just working that one. So it's pretty empty. Nothing to see in that. I'll do one more. And this one's heavier. Wow, so this is the phenomenon that we're going through this year. I'm glad this came up. So what's happening this year is babies. Uh, the, the queen's getting upstairs. We've put a queen separator on. Um, by some apparent reason, it's happening all over Cape Cod this year where the queens are not just staying down below they are coming upstairs and I'll explain that to you in another segment but just fascinating to see these are babies I'm gonna open one up see can you see that's actual baby probably about 10 days old it takes 21 days so she's a little bit and sacrifice the life for this TV show but um, well worth the education of it all so she's not supposed to be laying upstairs and she is so um, I'm going to leave them, leave them be, no pun intended, and let the, the tenders, the bee tenders, take care of it because they know what they're doing way more than we do. So that's really neat. And now it makes me curious. I want to pull up a couple more really quickly just to see if there's more brood being born upstairs where it shouldn't be. Oh, and look at that, there's tons. What a shame. So it's a phenomenon this year that's going on in nature and we don't know why. Look, a whole nother batch. Can you tell the difference? I'm just gonna show it here one more time. This is all baby brood and this is all capped honey. So I don't know if you can tell the difference. Um, this is the honey and this is the babies. And you don't want babies mixed in with their honey because when you extract the honey from the hive, you're gonna have bodies in your honey. So this is where it's getting frustrating for beekeepers. I <laughs> uh, will not be able to extract honey from this uh, whole shallow. This is called a shallow. And then these are called deeps. You can see the size difference. The deeps stay with the queen all winter and the shallows are our honey but since she's laying upstairs even with the queen separator on this little brown piece I'm not going to be able to extract that honey uh, I will be giving it to them for, as food throughout the winter 
for their survival in hopes that they survive and that would be their food so that was hive number one what do you think fun right <laughs> This is their front porch. And the neat thing about the front porch is there's usually one bee on this side who uh, is told by the bees that have gone out to forage like where, where they went, where they found you know, good food sources. So someone comes in and tells the bee on the front porch, you know, turn left at the, the large apple tree and there's good food. So this bee tells this messenger bee where to go. So when the bees go out, they're told exactly where to go. Honeybees have the most efficient communication, they say on the planet, of all the tribes and um, flocks and prides out there. Uh, honeybees um, have, have the greatest uh, ability to to tell each other what's going on at all times. And that's just one of the neat little uh, ironic things that they do for each other to be more efficient than any anything else on this planet. So they hang out on the front porch when it's, when it's really hot at night and they fan themselves to cool off. Uh, the queen is to be kept at 92 degrees at all times, which is really fascinating. In the winter, they, they really huddle and cuddle and in the summer they fan her. So um, it's just it's just one of the neatest things. I learned so much from, from honeybees. Honeybees in the summertime only live to about three weeks old. Why is that? Because of their wings, usually. It's their wings that go first. They're constantly moving. It's their form of communication. And so the overuse of wings, I see them walking into their little hive sometimes, always, you know, they're, they're tampered wings. And it just fascinates me to realize, you know, what it is that they go through every single day in order to, you know, give us what we need to survive. They say a third of everything on our plate is thanks to a honeybee. Uh, they have been on this planet through time, uh, through since vegetation has. And um, without them, they believe that the human race will not last more than five years. At this point in time, bees are, are really showing signs that they're uncomfortable on this planet and it's due to human impact. We are really overusing chemicals. Um, even in our daily lives, we don't understand the products that we're purchasing. They're really detrimental to them. Uh, even things right now at Lowe's and you know other general stores, there are plants that have uh, fertilizers in them and pesticides in them that are harmful. The neonicotinoids are killing honeybees. They've linked it to deaths of monarchs um, by the masses. Um, and also now birds. Birds are dying out in the Midwest and there's absorbent amounts of numbers and they're directly linking it to chemicals. So the best thing that we can do for honeybees is a couple of things. Plant anything that flowers. That's the easy thing right off the bat. But if you don't have garden space or you don't want to, you know, do that, the next best thing that we can do for honeybees is actually really take in consideration what we're purchasing every single day. Just because it's on the shelves at you know, from garden centers to grocery stores doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's good for the environment or good for us. Um, really looking at ingredients, if you can't understand the word, it's not going to be good for them. Uh, going back to basics, I kind of look at the way things were, the way we cleaned our houses like a hundred years ago. If we could 
go back to the lemons and the vinegars and the baking sodas and baking powders to get the job done. It's much more delicate and gentle to anything in the environment. As we all know, whatever goes down our sinks, we're going to consume. We live above an aquifer, so we've got to consider that too. So I wanted to share with everybody um, what goes on inside a hive and how to get it out, right? So this is going to be how to extract honey. And this is called the extractor. Basically, through centrifugal force, it takes the honey out of the frames. So let's back up. I'll explain. Um, here are our frames. And this is a shallow, as you see, I just made it deep, so baked on that one. Here are the deeps that are brand new. You can see the size difference. This is for their home for the winter, and this is for the honey that we get to keep. So, when it comes out of a hive, these little um, packets are full of honey, right? And what we do is, it's called capped honey. And you literally take a knife and you have to take the cap off of the actual wax comes right off. So then it's just dripping honey. And so this comes off, you save the wax in a bowl, you do both sides, and you take your dripping honey and you put it into the extractor. And the extractor has three actual places to put three for balance purposes. So you've got your three frames inside and through centrifugal force, you pull it down and you pretty much go as fast as you can. It draws the honey out of the comb and we taps out the bottom here into one, not just one, but two, even finer mesh. Um, gets into this container. You can tell the bees are loving this up. And then you tap it out again and it goes into your jars. And there's different grades of honey that depend on what vegetation the bees are foraging. So this is a, what we call a locust honey. It's a really light golden honey. And this is usually late spring. And this is more of the midsummer amber honey. And again, it's just because of the particular flowers that are around that time of year. And this is more like September, like a last harvest, the dark honey. So you can see the three grades are really distinctly different. They taste different. They have different nutritional values. Um, so this is the extraction process. The easy way to get it out of the hive. The other way is just to keep the honeycomb, but then you can't keep the frame. So this frame I can use year after year after year. You just keep them in a good storage in the winter sealed. And then you can use them again next year. So that's the extraction process. How come honey doesn't spoil? Well, it starts with what the bees do inside the hive. They actually, with their wings, fan all the moisture out of honey before they cap it off. So if we extract the honey and get it into jars and store jars in you know, dark closets or shade, honey can be stored without spoiling for centuries. It's actually been found in, in tombstones. Honey has other wonderful medicinal properties it is antibacterial, antifungal, and antibiotic. Honey has been used as medicine. It was the first medicine actually on the planet. Um, and so it can be used interior or exterior. You can use it on your skin. Um, it aids in digestion. Do your own research, but 
it's really one of the greatest medicines we have on earth. For those people with allergies, honey is a great remedy. What the bees do is they travel a three mile square radius collecting from different types of plants, um, some you know things that people are allergic to. And so if you have a tablespoon of what's called local honey, what's that mean? Local to you, wherever you lay down your head at night, about five mile to 10 mile distance, if you can find a hive and get honey um, that's local to you, and have a tablespoon in the morning and a tablespoon in the afternoon every day that will aid in allergies try it sometime it works i think that the that we can we can as a whole actually make a difference you know if each one of us just does our part that ends up being power in numbers and it ends up making a complete difference for the whole entire planet. So be conscious and aware. Your dollar becomes your vote. Where you buy things matters. You have all these little things to think about every single day. That's the best thing we can do for the honeybees is do not purchase harmful products. Do not put your money where it's going to hurt the bees. And the next best thing is to support them, you know. Um, grow them vegetation and educate yourself um, to see what's going on in other parts of the world with honeybees. Because there's so little of them in China right now, humans are pollinating. They're human pollinators. It's a job. Um, and I mean, ultimately, it's, it's part of the course of the life that we're heading. It's not efficient enough. One honeybee can do 30 trees in a day, whereas one human, they estimated, they judged, it's three trees a day. So we're still not able to fill out those equations, you know. Uh, another interesting fact, um, MIT and Harvard have created the Robo Bee and the Mobo Bee, the Moby, excuse me. Um, and they're remote control bees now that they're trying to you know, figure out how to get them to pollinate as efficiently and effectively as as actual real um, bees. And so keep your eyes open on that and do research on that because that's fascinating. Um, it it, it kind of bothers me that we're not putting our money towards lessening our impact on chemicals and instead creating, you know, a metal robo bee that's going to take over the natural process. I just don't know in the end if, it, if it's really going to make the equation uh, uh, work out. Um, but it's where we're at at this time and age, current events. Um, but honeybees are really showing signs of, of, it's called the colony collapse disorder, CCD, where they leave the hives and they're not coming back. Um, and this is, again, around the world, huge red alert. They named it in 2007, and it's been seven years now. And each winter, it's less population worldwide and less and less. As much as we keep requeening, growing queens, um, splitting hives, um, making nukes, there's all these things that beekeepers are, are really working on. Um, it, we're still not able to keep them comfortable here. We're still seeing a lot of deaths going on worldwide. So it's about a balance. And I really think that they, honeybees, are the canaries in the coal mine. They're telling us something. They're telling us that they're not comfortable on this planet. That there's too much going on. It's in the water, it's in the air, it's in their food sources. That's also happening to us. The way I see it is there it's a message they're telling. And are we listening? Are we going to be doing enough to shift that balance? It's a perfect storm for them right now. And this is where we see there's a problem. We say there's a problem. How much lag time is it going to take before we can actually heal the situation?
we'll see. Uh, we'll see if they even make it through the winter. At this point, I've got one hive that's looking great and the other hive is not. Um, and it's pretty much, a, in a way, it's a game. But myself, as a 14-year beekeeper, completely deathly allergic to honeybees, <laughs> this, is, uh, this, is, this is life. It's not a game. This is our life source. If we could all learn more about the beauty of honeybees, we would have um, hopefully a longer, healthier, happier, safer pathway this lifetime. Would you like to become a beekeeper? It's real easy and it's so much fun. I went to this class in Barnstable. It's called the Barnstable County Beekeepers Association, BCBA. And we meet once a month, Tuesday, uh, one Tuesday night a month for two hours and learn the pests, the diseases, how to feed the bees, and actually how to make your own equipment. So classes start in the fall and by January you're purchasing equipment and bees and by late April, early May, the bees come to town. It's an incredible, incredible day to have a package of bees with your queen inside and actually, you know, introduce them to a hive that you have built yourself and painted. And, and it's easy from there on in because they do all the work. <laughs> we just keep an eye and monitor and, you know, shift things here and there, collect some honey and take notes of what they're going through through time so if you want to become a beekeeper it's really easy to do on cape cod and it doesn't cost too much it's a fun hobby to do with your loved ones and your family and it's necessary we definitely need more beekeepers <laughs> so thanks for uh, joining us on polka tv uh, today and um Please, again, do your own research and do whatever you can to lessen your pact on our aquifer as well as our environment. And that starts at home with you, just by the way you're purchasing things. And, um, and reach out to beekeepers. We need as much support as we can get. You know, they're, you know they say, um, get to know your farmer because they feed you three meals a day. <laughs> so um, be well and uh, keep up the buzz. <laughs>